So, a CEO, an Aloha shirt, and Lego show up at the D&D table. Sounds like the beginning of a joke, and probably not a very funny one at that. Anyway, as I'm sure you've heard, the CEO of Wizards of the Coast has resigned. Plenty of other YouTubers have commented on this topic, and I wasn't really going to make a video about it. I'm not really all about that inside baseball mentality when it comes to my favorite game, D&D. Except, I was talking with a friend recently about a related topic, and I found out that I did have something unique that I wanted to say. So once again, what do a former CEO, a shirt, and building bricks have in common? It's all about understanding, or not understanding, the D&D brand. Let's get to it. Hey folks. If you're enjoying the content on this channel, please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons. It really does help promote this video to other folks and doesn't cost anything. And now, back to the show. Cynthia Williams, former CEO of Wizards, recently announced her resignation after a tumultuous two-year reign as head of the company. She started her tenure by saying that the D&D brand was under-monetized, a soundbite which became a rallying cry for a fan base accusing Hasbro of just looking at the balance sheets and not the players. This, coupled with her previous position with Xbox Gaming, immediately led many in the D&D community to fear she was going to abandon tabletop and pen and paper and push D&D fully into a digital realm, like, say, D&D Beyond, which Wizards had just acquired for a staggering amount of coin. Similarly, She's been at the head of the table for a number of other missteps, most notably the OGL debacle, where Wizards tried to revoke the seemingly unrevocable license that allows D&D creators, including me, to create new content for the game. That ended up in a number of protests and boycotts from the fans, along with a bunch of mea culpas from Wizards, including releasing most of the 5e rules under an untouchable Creative Commons license. This also caused companies like Cobalt Press and Piezo to come out with their own systems that are completely separate from the 5e rule set. This will invariably fracture the D&D fan base, squandering all the good the OGL built up since it was originally released in 2000. Likewise, there was the Magic the Gathering 30th anniversary fiasco, where non-tournament legal packs of cards were released for $1,000 that's four packs of 16 cards, or about $15.60 a card. I'll admit I'm not a Magic the Gathering person, but even I know this is a horrible deal, and a tone-deaf offering to a community that has made and continues to make this game so popular. On top of this, there were a number of lesser issues that occurred under the Williams reign. For example, this past December, there was a deep round of layoffs across the Wizards employee base, though Wizards has done this time and again when they're close to releasing a new edition of the game. This was especially bad in light of those previous missteps and because it was so close to the holidays. Also, the overall declining sales of D&D. But again, this happens when they're getting ready to release a new edition of the game. Lastly, there was the soft box office numbers for Honor Among Thieves. I think there's a number of reasons for this, but being caught in the tailwinds of that OGL issue may have had something to do with it. All of this basically resulted in a less than stellar performance record for Williams and may have led to her resignation. I have no inside information, but two bumpy years is surely not what was expected from someone who was envisioned as being a game changer for the brand. Instead, what I see here is a profile of someone, more accurately a leadership team, that didn't fully understand the fan base or the culture of the game. D&D is an Xbox, and while the community around it is varied, the most enthusiastic are also the most loyal, and the most resistant to change, especially if that change is seen as purely profit-motivated and lacking respect for the game. Heck, 4th edition was seen that way, being too much of a departure from previous editions and coming just five years after the 3.5 edition. Likewise, I'm part of the camp that sees this new edition as really just a way to cash in on the hoopla surrounding the game's 50th anniversary. Conversely, I think some of the key reasons that 5th edition is so well received, even after 10 years, 
is that A, it consolidated what worked in all past editions, even 4th edition, and B, simplified the game without dumbing it down or making it too different. In short, the designers understood what fans wanted and created something we would like. Unlike Cynthia Williams, the upper management at Wizards, and Hasbro, here are just two examples of companies who understand the D&D brand and the community and are creating products that successfully embrace its audience with staggering success. First is Ray and Spooner. Hope I'm getting that name right. They make high-end, expensive, shirts. What they call Aloha shirts, and what we used to call Hawaiian shirts. Now, I've seen other companies making D&D Hawaiian shirts. Most of these are just random monsters or random polyhedral dice. But when I looked more closely at the Ray and Spooner shirt, I saw something different. Something more. They actually took the time to create a shirt pattern that leans into the core of D&D. The shirt pattern is actually made up of six vignettes, each one representing one of the core abilities of every D&D character. Strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. By doing this, they created a shirt that serves not just as a piece of branding, but as a deep connection between every player and every character they've ever played. This detail makes me want this shirt more than something that's just slapped on with a logo or an ampersand. This design feels like it was developed by gamers for gamers. And it's paying off. Their shirts are on back order for the next few months at the time of this recording. Another example, and one I've been talking about on this channel for some time, is Lego. With their new Lego D&D set, Red Dragon's Tale. Now, while this seems to be a closer collaboration between LEGO and WOTC than some of the other licensees, there are still parts that are clearly driven by LEGO. The first thing I feel LEGO did right was not trying to be the arbiter of what people wanted. Leveraging a modified version of their popular ideas model, instead of developing what they think the gaming community would want from a D&D LEGO set, instead they crowdsourced ideas, leading to some very interesting concepts including more than a few I hope get created at a later date. Then, after a final design was picked by the wisdom of the crowd, LEGO had their best set designers strengthen and expand that idea into the product that was recently released. Along with a great set, they enhanced that content with that gift with purchase mimic treasure chest to help drive initial release sales. Additionally, it's already been confirmed that we're getting a collection of D&D branded Lego minifigs towards the end of the year to drive further interest in this sub-theme. Figures including the Vampire Strahd, Tasha the Witch, and the Enigmatic Lady of Pain, to name just a few. Where I think WotC contributed was with the accompanying module by prolific author and WotC guru Chris Perkins, as well as a live play streamed event with several D&D influencers and that set's original creator. Seeing what licensees like Rand Spooner and Lego have done with the D&D brand, specifically by understanding what the community would want, hopefully has created a blueprint for other companies to follow. Maybe even the mothership, Hasbro. Cheers. Till next time.